Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening webinar. Uh, this evening, we're dealing with uh, a really very important topic that uh, probably hasn't changed very much in 100 years. And then in the last 15 to 20 years, it has changed out of all recognition. And those of us of a certain age would have spent a lot of time in our earlier years um, winkling out appendixes through a small uh, incision, a lands incision or a gridiron incision in, in the, uh, the right iliac fossa. And that's where we learnt our surgical techniques. Uh, and then first came laparoscopy. And I'm not sure whether we'll hear whether the robot has a role. Uh, somehow I think it's probably a little excessive to pull the robot out for an appendix. But then came all this new information uh, about mucinous adenocarcinoma, the appendix, and pseudomyxoma peritonei, and the pre-malignant changes that we find sometimes in the appendix when it's been taken out. And now this actually is a frequent issue that comes up at uh, MDMs when somebody uh, has had a routine, or a, a, not a routine, but, a, uh, but a, a, an urgent appendicectomy, but it's considered routine and then suddenly uh, there's a question mark about uh, whether or not they need to be followed up or do they need anything else. Over the last uh, decade, Jürgen Muslow has uh, established uh, the National uh, um, uh, uh, Pseudomyxoma uh, Peritonei Unit um, in, in the Mater Hospital. And uh, through that, uh, he and his colleagues have developed a particular expertise in dealing with these difficult issues. And so I'm very grateful to Jürgen uh, for putting together uh, this evening's webinar, which I think will be of considerable interest. Uh, we're grateful to Des Toomey, surgeon at the Midlands Regional Hospital in the Mater, and also uh, John Aird, who is a pathologist at the Mater Hospital, who will speak to us. The house rules are that if you're not speaking, you should probably turn off your camera. That way it makes it much easier for all of us uh, who are watching uh, the proceedings uh, not to be distracted. And also kindly do turn off your microphone uh, because sometimes there's an echo or background noise that comes through and disturbs uh, the uh, presentation. So uh, with that, I'm handing over to Jürgen and I'm looking forward to a very interesting uh, presentation. Thanks, Jürgen. Thank you, and uh, I'm very happy to be asked to help with the, this webinar series, which I think we all agree has been a very successful initiative by the RCSI. I'm also very grateful to my two colleagues, uh, Des and John, for agreeing to contribute to this uh, to this important topic of acute appendicitis and then the, the follow on of the unexpected tumour at appendicectomy. So Des is going to speak first. He's well known to the surgical audience, having come back to us uh, from Hull uh, roughly seven years ago, and he splits his practice between the Matter and Mullingar. And the Matter he provides, provides his specialist colorectal practice while in Mullingar. He has a very busy general surgery practice and a very busy emergency practice uh, catering for both adult and uh, paediatric uh, population. So he's ideally placed to update us on the, the, the important topic of the, uh, the management of acute appendicitis and how that has evolved. And then John will go on to talk about how we should approach um, and what we should do with the patient who has an incidental finding of a tumour in the appendix. And John came back to the matter two years ago from Vancouver. I think it's fair to say that he's really transformed our understanding and our approach to this very complex patient group. The nomenclature in this group is very difficult for us all to understand, and I'm sure that he'll be able to give us some clarity as to how we should approach these patients. So we'll start off with Des, uh, my colleague uh, who works in the matter in Mullingar. Thanks, Des, and uh, over to you. Thanks, Jürgen, and uh, thank you for inviting me to contribute this evening. Um, next slide, please. So uh, there are tens of thousands of papers about appendicitis, many of which disagree with each other. Um, and so the way I'm going to approach this is I've come up with a list of about 10 questions that are commonly asked, particularly by SORs as they cycle through the department about why we do things a certain way. And I've tried to come up with evidence based answers to support those uh, or to answer those questions. Next slide, please. So straight into it. So the first question is, 
are preoperative scoring systems of any particular use. And this is a study from the right iliac fossa treatment group in the UK, where they took 15 different scores and they decided that uh, the most applicable one in women was the adult appendicitis score and in men was the appendicitis inflammatory response score. And then they retrospectively applied these scores to over 5,000 patients across over 150 hospitals. They used the UK population because the UK population has quite a high negative appendicectomy rate compared to the rest of Western Europe. And they turned things on the head a little in that they wanted to know were these scores useful for sending people home rather than for diagnosing appendicitis. Two measures here, the specificity, uh, basically the higher the specificity, the more likely you are to send home the patients safely who don't have appendicitis. And the higher the failure rate, the more likely you are to send home someone who does have appendicitis and should have been admitted. Next slide, please. So looking at women first, uh, nearly 2000 patients, and they found the specificity rate here was 63%, and I, I guess a reasonably acceptable failure rate of 3.7%. This was a, a retrospective study, so these patients were all admitted and 84% of them uh, who had less than eight on this score never went on to have any surgery. And only about 8% ever had a second admission with recurrent pain. Those who did go on to have appendicectomies were almost all uh, normal, appendici uh, normal appendicectomies or uncomplicated appendicitis. Next slide, please. In men, it's a smaller uh, cohort. Uh, but similar enough outcomes, the sensitivity or the specificity rate is worse there, it's 25%, but the failure rate again, 2.5%. And again, you're seeing over 80% admitted without surgery and under 10% having to be readmitted with pain a second time. And again, here we see that all those who went on to have an appendicectomy were either a normal appendix or uncomplicated appendicitis. Next slide, please. And so, they applied this to the UK group initially because you can see here the normal appendicectomy rate in the UK is high, uh, whereas in the rest of Western Europe it's a good bit lower, probably because of better pre-hospital filtering out of the low-hanging fruit. When they applied these two scores to the Western Europe populations, including Ireland, they found that the, the specificity rate was lower and the failure rate was a good bit higher, up to uh, almost one in three in men. And so where do I think these scores lie? I think they're useful in the community pre-hospital, maybe the A&E setting for filtering out patients who don't likely have appendicitis. But I think once the patient has worked their way through to the surgical team, these scores are best an adjunct to experienced clinical assessment and imaging. And what about paediatrics? Um, this study group did a separate study looking at the Shearer score in paediatrics with very similar outcomes and we can draw the same conclusions. Next slide, please. So you've decided they have appendicitis. Well, is appendicectomy the best treatment for this if it's uncomplicated appendicitis? So this NOTA or non-operative treatment of appendicitis has been looked at, and I'm going to just show three, uh, three studies or three trials that looked at this. The first is the CODA trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. 1,500 patients randomized to antibiotics or surgery for uncomplicated appendicitis. And you can see that in the antibiotics group, they successfully managed 47% of these as outpatients. Um, however, nearly 30% or nearly one in three ended up having their appendix out in the first 90 days. And those that did cross over had a higher complication rate. It's interesting from the, from the graph that those who had an apodiculate were much more likely to fail antibiotic treatment than those who did not. Next slide. The APAP trial is an older trial and we've got some longer follow-up for it. It's worth noting that most of these were open appendicectomies, but in the first couple of mire here, you can see that the failure rate and the crossover to needing their appendix out rose from again 27% at one year to 39% after five years. And the second kaplan meyer compares those who still had pain two months after antibiotics to those who were pain free and those who still had ongoing pain were more likely to need their appendix out in the coming years. After seven years they published a satisfaction outcome and found that those who either had appendicectomy or antibiotics were reasonably equal satisfaction but those who crossed over were much less satisfied with the whole process. Next slide. Uh, the third trial is the COMA trial from Beaumont, published uh, earlier this year, the Annals of Surgery, 186 patients. And again, very similar outcomes. The recurrence rate here was 25% at one year, most of them in, in the first 150 days. And again, you can see surgery and antibiotics reasonably satisfied 
but those who crossed over were less satisfied with the whole process. Next slide. And so where does this leave us? So uh, in my opinion, I think 40% is probably an unacceptable recurrence rate. Uh, these trials didn't really answer what about children, uh, which is half of my appendicectomy population. Um, I think it is useful, particularly in teenage girls, for appendicitis to be excluded in subsequent gynecological pain, and it, it allows the parents to keep them at home rather than bring them back to hospital. Similar long-term outcomes, but the current Irish system uh, is poor for acute outpatient management. Uh, and if you end up treating these patients with antibiotics and they have problems, they end up having to come back through A&E and do further trolley weights before they get a bed. And so in my experience, almost all of patients and parents would prefer a single definitive intervention at the first presentation. Next slide. So you've decided to do the appendicectomy. How urgent is it? And I certainly know one of my colleagues uh, in the matter who has a complaint and possibly a lawsuit pending because a patient who was in theatre within 12 hours of presentation is claiming that the delay was too long and that's why he had perforated appendicitis. This is an older study from 06, but it nicely shows that in the first 24 hours, if the patient is on antibiotics, the risk of perforation is quite low and is acceptable. But once you go beyond 24, hour, 24 hours, the risk of perforation starts to climb. Next slide. And this is a meta-analysis from, uh, from 2014, looking at the same topic, uh, two and a half thousand patients. It is all non-randomized data, as most of the appendicitis trials are. Um, and again, this meta-analysis found that within the first 24 hours, the risk of perforation in patients on antibiotics was low and acceptable. It's worth looking back at the NOTA trials, uh, which also treated a whole load of patients with antibiotics, and most of them did not perforate in the first 24 hours. And so you could draw as a side conclusion from the NOTA trials that it is reasonable to wait until the next day as long as the patient is not perforated at presentation and is uh, stable. Next slide, please. So when you're in there with the laparoscope and the appendix looks normal, should you take it out or leave it in? The argument for taking it out is that what looks macroscopically normal can be microscopically abnormal. And the argument for leaving it in is that taking the appendix may increase the risk of complications. So the first trial here compared what the surgeon's opinion was with what the histopathologist's opinion was. And the key figure here is the 100 or the 26.7%. So 26.7% of the time, the surgeon, when the surgeon thought it was normal, there was microscopic inflammation. And overall, the surgeon and the pathologist disagreed 14% of the time. And I think that's a reasonably strong argument for taking out a normal appearing appendix. Next slide, please. But if you take out the appendix, are you increasing the risk of complications in your patient? This is an English study from 2014. And for this study, positive appendicectomies was only those with inflammation and negative appendicectomies was everything else. The authors of this study concluded that the complication rate in negative appendicectomy was almost as high as in positive appendicectomies, and so we shouldn't be doing them. However, I think we need to drill down into this a little more. The first thing I would say here is that, is it actually taking out the appendix or is it the entire trip to theatre and the laparoscopy that causes the, uh, the complication? I think taking out a straightforward normal appendix, it's very hard to blame that for urinary retention, uh, acquired pneumonia, UTIs, etc. The second thing is, is that there's quite a lot of wound infections in this study, and in particular, 12 of their patients, that's one in every 40, were turned to theatre for general anaesthetic to drain wound sepsis, which is something I would think is very rare in general practice. You'd have to question whether this study had appropriate antibiotic coverage, whether they used endo bags to take out the normal appendix, etc. And certainly, I, I don't feel that the complications here would be reflective of my practice. Next study, our next slide, please. What about if you get in there and it's an odd looking appendix? What should you do? Um, certainly, sometimes I can call Jurgen and, and he'll give me some advice, but if you're there and it's inflamed and you feel it needs to come out, uh, well then, take it out by all means, but try and keep it intact. Uh, try not to perforate it. Try to not unduly disturb the tissue planes. If there's any mucin, send it for cytology. For want of a better term, do an oncological appendicectomy. Take the meso appendix intact and unblock. There is a, a tendency, particularly with some of the more junior trainees, to strip the meso appendix off the appendix as they're taking it out. 
Uh, and mesopendicillin invasion is a key factor for determining whether right hemicolectomy is necessary, particularly in newer endocrine tumors. In the base, uh, you should secure the base. If the base is abnormal, you should mobilize the, uh, the cecal pole and take a cuff of cecum with a laparoscopic stapler. That photo there on the left is a patient of mine from about five years ago in her 20s, and that was a newer endocrine tumor, and she went on to have a node negative right hemicolectomy. Next slide, please. Is it necessary to leave a drain in once the appendix is out? Uh, I would think none of us would leave a drain in in uncomplicated appendicitis, but in complicated appendicitis, should you or should you not? This is a Cochrane review. It's not a great paper, but as it's a Cochrane review, I felt I should include it. It looks at open appendicectomies, uh, and the authors concluded that the evidence was very poor quality. There was a high risk of bias, and they couldn't really draw any conclusions. But they did point out that the drains had higher complication rates than those without a drain. Next slide, please. Uh, this is two studies. So the first study here on the left is looking at laparoscopic appendicectomies. Uh, you can see the black bars who had a drain have a higher complication rate than the gray bars who did not have a drain. But when you drill down into this a little, 260 patients in the, in the study, but 160 of them weren't perforated. 90 of them only had local peritonitis. And so I don't think most of us would use a drain in this scenario anyway. The second study here, again, comparing drain versus no drain. And again, they found that there was a higher complication rate, although not hugely significant, in the drain group versus the no drain group. Although this is retrospective data, and if you look at the conversion rate and the operative time, uh, the significantly higher in the drain group, suggesting a degree of bias that the drains were put into the worst appendixes. It's hardly surprising if they had a higher rate of complications. I don't tend to use drains unless the patient has quite a bad generalized peritonitis and I've done a lot of laparoscopic lavage, particularly around the small bowel loops. I feel you don't really get all that wash back out through the suction, and so I tend to leave a drain in the pelvis for 24, 36 hours to let that wash out and then remove it and continue the antibiotics. Next slide, please. What about post-operative antibiotics? Are they needed and for how long? It's very clear from the literature that uncomplicated appendicitis does not need post-operative antibiotics. If there's a delay in getting to the theatre, absolutely. And at induction, yes, you're normal according to your protocol. But once the appendix is out, you can cross them off the cardex. Next slide, please. But in complicated appendicitis, I think many, if not all of us, would tend to use antibiotics. And so the question, I guess, is, is for how long? So the first study here uh, looked at over a thousand patients. And you can see from the far spot that they concluded here that five days was an adequate length of antibiotics that if you went on longer than five days, it, it didn't improve the complication outcomes. If you look at the second one, the second study here on the right hand side, this is a pediatric population. I like the study. It, it looked at over 500 patients, but they looked at whether you needed to give five days of IV or whether you could switch to oral once the, the patient had clinically improved to that degree. And they found that an oral switch had no difference in the rate of abscess, wound infection or readmission. Next slide. So this question, the appendix mass, whose job is it anyway? Is it for us or is it for the interventional radiologist? There are two ways of approaching this. The classical approach, which is antibiotics, placing a drain if there's an abscess and an interval appendicectomy, which we'll touch on in a couple of slides. Placing a drain and antibiotics has about a 90% success rate in settling things down. There can be difficult abscesses to reach deep in the pelvis and some abscesses which are under five centimeters are probably better treated with just antibiotics. The predictors of failure for this is if there's a large, poorly defined phlegmon or a multi-loculated abscess, and if there's a free-floating apodicolith in the abscess cavity. It's also worth remembering that interventional radiology drains have their own complications of between 6 and 10%, and you can see in the photograph there, uh, the drain's going straight through the cecum into the appendix abscess. What about if we go straight in with an immediate appendicectomy? Well, that's a high-risk procedure. There is increased surgical site infection, increased obstruction and iatrogenic injury risk, and there's a 25% risk of intestinal resection, usually a right hemicolectomy. If you do have to go in for whatever reason, if you don't have interventional radiology available, if the patient's septic and unwell, then you should use a laparoscopic approach and an experienced surgeon. I just want to talk about what about planned versus unplanned. So it may well happen that you laparoscope a patient, you may not have imaged them, particularly if there's a child and you find a mass, What's the best thing to do if you're already in the abdomen? Uh, 
I don't think there's any problem with having a trial of the section, but if the, if the appendix is not going to come out without, without undue risk, it's quite acceptable to do a laparoscopic drainage of the abscess, retrieve the appendicular, leave a surgical drain, and withdraw to come back another day if necessary. Next slide. So this is a, a meta-analysis, six studies, uh, again, non-randomized data, uh, looking at the, the risk of complications uh, between interval and emergency appendicectomy. And you can see here that the risk of a bowel resection, again, 25%, similar to what the previous slide, and that a higher or uh, longer operating time, both uh, statistically significant, showing how difficult this procedure can be and the risks that are involved in it. Next slide, please. And so you've settled it down with your drain and your antibiotics. Do you need to go back and take out the appendix? I'm not going to get too bogged down in the tumours because John's going to talk about that. But the first study here on the left is a paediatric population, and they concluded that the risk of recurrent appendicitis is about one in five, and the risk of a complication during the interval appendicectomy is about three and a half percent. If the patient has ongoing symptoms, or if there is an ongoing uh, radiological abnormality, or if there's an appendicular in the appendix, then the risk is probably higher, and that would strengthen the argument for doing an interval appendicectomy. There is a paper that suggests that the risk of recurrent appendicitis in the adult is a little lower, probably around the 10% mark. But in an adult, you have the risk of leaving behind something more nasty if you don't take out the appendix. So the second study here on the right looked at over 400 patients across eight studies, and they found that the risk of a neoplasm in an interval appendicectomy was 11%. A lot of these were mucinous neoplasms, uh, and some of them were benign adenomas, but nonetheless, they all have malignant potential in the future. I did see another study that suggests that if you have a recurrent ap appendix abscess in a short period of time, then the risk of a neoplasm in that appendix is 60%. And so I think it's a difficult question. I would have tended in my career to do interval appendicectomies. I, I'm kind of swaying away from that a little now, but I think need, you need to have a conversation with your patient or your parent on each individual basis and make a decision that suits that particular patient. Next slide. What about the dropped appendix stone, the errant appendicular? Do you take it or do you leave it? And these normally come to our attention because they've caused an abscess. Uh, the first study here on the left is Saudi Arabian study, only two patients. I just put it up because they drained two abscesses, uh, didn't remove the appendicular with any surgical procedure, had no recurrence at a year, and claimed that this was a success. Uh, I have to say I, I wouldn't be hanging my hat on that evidence. The second study here from the BMJ is just a nice technique. You can see it's a difficult location tucked in behind the liver. They felt that it was a high risk of having to do an open operation. And so having drained the abscess, they used the drain to place a guide wire and then a 30 French Teflon sheath into the abscess cavity under anesthetic. And they used a pediatric colonoscope to go into the cavity and remove the, the appendicular left of the drain and the patient made a full recovery. I think it's a nice technique that would, would have a place in certain, uh, in certain locations and certain difficult to reach uh, appendicular and abscesses. Next slide. These are two of my patients uh, from about three years ago. They came in on the same weekend. Uh, the first patient on the left had had a lap appendix with one of my colleagues three weeks earlier and came back with an abscess with an appendicular in it. Saturday morning with no IR, so we went in with a laparoscope and located where the abscess was. And it was all a bit stuck, so rather than risk damaging the bowel, I just did a quick gridiron straight down onto it, blunt dissectioning with the finger, drained the abscess, retrieved the stone and left to drain and he did fine. Second patient presented the same day, uh, an older man with a uh, bowel obstruction, and there was a, an inflammatory mass in the mesentery of the small bowel with what looked like a foreign body. We thought he might have perforated something through the small bowel into the mesentery. But in laparotomy, it turned out to be an appendicular, and so he, we removed that in a, a short resection and anastomosis, and he did fine. The interesting thing about him was he was 48 years post-open appendicectomy that had been done by the flying doctors in Australia in his youth. So these errant appendicular do come back to haunt you. And I think if they come to your attention, it is worthwhile retrieving them. Next slide, please. And what about in pregnancy? Something we see a bit of in Munangar. Um, so uh, the first study here on the left is a California study, nearly 2 million patients. And appendicitis in pregnancy is generally reasonably bad news. Uh, it's associated with a much higher risk of uh, pregnancy complications and poor outcomes. 
The second study here on the right, if you look at the papers, the obstetric papers, they all seem to quote these two figures of the risk of fetal loss in perforated versus uncomplicated appendicitis. And when you go back through it, it actually dates back to 1977. I'm not sure if you can apply those figures quite strictly to modern medicine, but I, I do think we could, we could all agree that perforated appendicitis is bad news in pregnancy. We saw earlier that the risk of perforation increases after 24 hours, and so you shouldn't really procrastinate. If you think they have appendicitis, uh, you shouldn't let them being pregnant to prevent you from operating on them. Next slide, please. Diagnosing it can be difficult. Um, ultrasound, certainly in our hospital, is quite poor at diagnosing appendicitis. CT is generally not used in pregnancy because of the radiation risk. And so if you have an MRI, uh, is it worth doing? This is a meta-analysis, and the closer the red dots are to the top left-hand corner, the more accurate the study. And so you can see MRI is very accurate for diagnosing appendicitis in pregnancy. But if you don't have MRI or it's out of hours or it's a weekend and you don't have it, then I, I would think if you think they have appendicitis clinically, you shouldn't be de really delaying and you should get in and operate on them. Next slide, please. So you've decided to operate. Should you do it lap or should you do it open? Uh, this study looking at nearly 6,000 cases across 20 different studies. And you can see there's no difference in cesarean section, preterm delivery or birth weight. And overall, the first part plot here favors the laparoscopic approach and overall complications. There's certainly also the technical uh, aspects of laparoscopic surgery, which favor it in that the appendix can be in very unusual positions. You're not trying to decide where to place your incision. And you can also see the rest of the abdomen, and particularly things like the ovaries, uh, if they've tortured or have a cyst or cecal diverticulitis, et cetera. There, are, there, there is a, uh, some data out there suggesting that the risk of fetal loss is higher in laparoscopic appendicectomies, and that's the second virus plot, but that is bi mostly biased by this McGarry et al. study, which is an old study from the late 90s. Only 14% of the cases were laparoscopic. Surgery was at a very early part of the learning curve, and so I think you can exclude that study. And if you exclude that study, all the newer studies report laparoscopic approach is probably a bit safer, if not the same. And the number you want to be telling your patients is about a four and a half percent fetal loss rate. That compares to probably a one in three rate if you leave them too long and they perforate. Next slide, please. So almost finished. Now this is uh, just a, a patient from last April, 28 year old, her third pregnancy, 20 weeks gestation. She'd been in earlier in the week. Feeling unwell, it was attributed to the vaccine that she'd had. She came back in and we were asked to see her on the Sunday, white cells and CRP markedly elevated with a temperature, very sore in the renal angle and the, the right flank up around towards the right upper quadrant. And it was very uncertain whether this was polynephritis or retrocecal appendicitis. I did offer her a laparoscopy that Sunday and she declined. Uh, and so we commenced her on antibiotics. Next slide. The Monday morning, she had an ultrasound, which was very inconclusive, definitely something going on around the right kidney, hepatic flexures, some hepatic space. At the same time, our MSU came back positive for E. coli, which clouded the waters a little. It didn't really sit well with us that it was um, polynephritis, so we continued our antibiotics and we had a slot for an MRI the next morning, so went ahead with that. Next slide. And you can see here the MRI shows a retrocecal appendicitis with an abscess tucked up under the liver and in behind the hepatic flexure. Our radiologist was able to get a drain into a very posterior approach and drained pus. Next slide, please. She got a good boost from that initially, but then after a few days started to kind of stagnate, COP going back up, a bit of a temperature, and she consented on day 12 to a laparoscopy. Uh, for the trainees, you can see the first photograph there, the size of the gravid uterus filling the lower abdomen, and she had this dense mass on the right side, got into the abscess cavity, removed about half a dozen fecalits, drained the pus, and by flushing the radiological drain from the back, we were able to flush out that cavity and get it clean decided not to proceed any further at that stage and placed a radiological drain. Next slide, or placed a surgical drain. Initially, we thought we were winning, um, but then on kind of day 18, 19, she was still in hospital, a bit of fecal stain, fluid in the drain on day 19, so we went for to consent her and proceeded with a hemicolectomy the next day. Next slide. And you can see here in the first couple of pictures that the mass on the right side Knowing you were doing a right hemi from the outset certainly made this easier because you could do a medial to lateral approach, protect your retroperitoneal structures with a swab, and then take the mass down. There was a missed appendicular there, and that was the cause of the fecal staining. There was no fistula. You can see the mass is removed through a small incision, uh, hand sewn anastomosis as usual, a couple of drains, and she did well. She went on to have a healthy baby at full term.
Next slide, please. And then finally, is colonoscopy necessary after you've removed the appendix? I think many of us do scope our over 40s or our over 50s. Uh, very little data on this, but this is a nice study from New Zealand looking at over 600 patients. And what they did was they assigned a risk to each patient as if they hadn't had an appendicectomy and then looked at the number that came back with cancer in three years compared to what they would have expected. The top table here includes those who had malignancy in their appendicectomy specimen, so we should probably exclude them and go straight to the bottom table, number four. And here you can see that people who had a normal, uh, you know, a normal appendicitis, if they're between 45 and 60, they had a six-fold increase risk of presenting with colorectal cancer in the next three years. And how does this translate overall? So the overall incidence uh, in all age brackets over the age of 45 is 1%, and if they're between 45 and 60, 2% will have a colorectal cancer in the next three years. And so I think that does argue that it's reasonable to do a colonoscopy in everybody over 45 yep. if they're presented with appendicitis. Now we're just done. Next slide. Finally, this is just a quick study from a quick survey of Irish and European surgeons, and you can see what they all what they all think. Uh, most don't use the scoring systems. Uh, most think appendicectomy, normal appendicectomy, under 10%. Uh, most do remove a normal appendix. Don't use NOTA, and only about a third do an interval appendicectomy. Next slide. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, as always, a very clear presentation, and I think the format you followed was really helpful as it addressed the, the questions that we all encounter on a regular basis in our clinical practice. So thank you again. I think the format typically is that we don't take questions at this stage. We'll go on to John's presentation and then we'll allow time for questions for both Des and John at the end. So thanks again, Des, and I'll hand over to Dr. John Ayrton. Thanks, Jürgen. Um, I'll share my screen. So I think you should be able to see that. Is that correct? Thank you. That's fine. Thanks, John. Perfect. So um, I'm going to talk about incidental tumours of the appendix. And I just want to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, I have no conflicts of interest, interest to declare. So really, this whole talk is geared towards a specific situation, which has already been mentioned. You do your appendicectomy. You're hoping to sign off a, a routine case, and then the pathology report comes back and it says that there's a tumor in the appendix, and you say, Oh, great. Uh, and you know, what was supposed to be straightforward now becomes a little bit more complicated. So, this is just to go through some of the common entities you're going to encounter and how best to manage them. So, I'm going to talk about the different tumors that you'll encounter. I'm going to focus nearly all of the talk on mucinous neoplasms, but I will also talk, I think mainly because they're the most complicated and difficult to understand, but I'll also talk about carcinomas, some benign entities and potential mimics, and I'll briefly touch on neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors are the most common, but I think they're the most, the, the tumors that we're most familiar with, familiar with as well. Uh, I'll mention the important parameters that you need to look out for in your pathology report, and also talk about the treatment and surveillance protocols. So firstly, just nomenclature and classification, and I apologize in advance. This is a, a bit of a mess of an area, appendiceal tumors. It is getting better, but in the pathology world, we're still uh, discussing different uh, names for entities and how best to class classify them. Uh, the nomenclature and classifications that I think we all should use, uh, the PSOGI or the Peritoneal Surface Oncology Group International, their publications on mucinous neoplasms are widely accepted now. And also by the, the adopted by the Royal College of Pathologists of the UK. And in terms of neuroendocrine tumors, ENETS or the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, I think they're the entities that we really should be following. So, mucinous tumors. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about lamins or low grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms. These are the most frequently encountered incidental uh, mucinous neoplasm in the appendix. Uh, there's some incorrect terminology still in use, such as mucosal, which is more of a descriptive term, which uh, talks about really a mucin-filled appendix rather than saying what the underlying pathology is. And thing, entities such as mucinous cystadenoma or borderline tumor, they're now defunct uh, redundant terms that we don't use. So it's all really termed lamin. Lamins, they occur in a wide age range, but they're most commonly seen in age 60 to 70. And males and females are equally affected. So why are lamins confusing? Why are they complex? And why is it a difficult thing to get your head around? Well, 
lamins are different to other tumors. They, they, they behave differently to other tumors and their biology is different. And there's three main reasons why a lamin is different to other tumors. Um, so lamin, why is it different to other tumors? Um, we have this pushing invasion rather than typical invasion, invasive pattern, um, but it can also spread to the peritoneal cavity. It can cause pseudomyxoma peritonei. And within the lamin component, you may develop a mucinous adenocarcinoma component, which is invasive. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about the pushing invasion pattern. Next slide. So um, I'm just going to talk about the colon, so colon cancer. Next slide. So you can flick through just to the end of this. Yeah, keep going. So this is just to show normal uh, histology within the colon, epithelium, crypts, lamina propria, muscularis mucosa. Keep going. Next. Um, the submucosa. And just to note that then there's vessels and nerves. And next. And then the subserosa here at the bottom, and the dotted line is the peritoneal surface. Next. And in colon cancer, just keep, keep clicking next, please. Um, you get this development of dysplasia, uh, accumulation of mutations, you get high grade dysplasia. Next. And that continues on with accumulation of mutations. And then you get invasive adenocarcinoma when, this, when the cells rupture through or invade through the muscularis mucosa, and they now have access to nerves and vessels, and they can spread to distant sites. And this really is the same in most other uh, carcinomas in the body, where penetration through a basement membrane or a muscularis mucosa allows access to vessels and nerves, and that's what we term carcinoma. Next. So lamins are different. Uh, next. So in a lamin, we have this epithelium, which is this uh, up, up, at the, up at the top, the stripy lines. This is a neoplastic mucinous epithelium, and it's not invasive. But the cells do produce mucin because they're mucinous cells. Next. So there's mucin production next. And as the mucin pr is produced, next, keep clicking. Uh, the, the appendix will enlarge and you'll get this increased amount of pressure within the appendix. Next. And this pressure plus the neo neoplastic proliferation of the epithelium. Next. This causes downward pressure and the epithelium, keep, keep clicking next it pushes down onto the muscular as appropriate and you essentially obliterate the mucosa, the submucosa. Now you're not invading into it, but you have obliterated it. So there's no vessels or nerves that are in danger of being infiltrated. So there's no danger, um, there's no risk, there's, there's negligible risk of spread to distant sites, but we are now down at the muscular as propria with an epithelium sitting on top. Next. And this is just to show you what it's like in real life. On the left-hand side is a normal appendix and all that dark blue stuff, that's the mucosa and the submucosa and lymphoid tissue. And then on the right is a lamin and we have that frilly surface at the top, that's the epithelium. And underneath it is pink muscularis propria and there's nothing in between. So it's just epithelium straight onto muscularis propria. So this creates a conundrum in that it's not invasive, but it's also within the muscularis propria. So do you say this is T2 or it's a non-invasive? Next. So the way lamin is staged is it's staged differently because of this. So typically in an adenocarcinoma, we have T1, T2, T3, and T4 as described. Next. But in a lamin, there's no such thing as T1 or T2 because of this sort of uh, disappearance of the submucosa and this sort of compression of all the all the tissue down onto the muscularis propria. Instead, we call it PTIS, which means that it's within the appendiceal wall. And the IS means in situ. So we're not really saying it's invasive. It's just T lamin in situ. And then if it goes into the subserosa or the, if there's breach of the peritoneum, we say it's T3 or T4. Next. So that's pushing invasion. Next. What about its potential to spread and cause pseudomyxoma? Uh, next one. So just going back, if we have mucin and the neoplastic epithelium sitting on top of the muscle wall, oftentimes the muscle is quite firm. The appendix will grow and grow, and there's no real risk of uh, distance spread, but the appendix may grow to a very large size. It's only when the neoplastic epithelium has a chance to rupture out into the peritoneal cavity that uh, there's a chance of pseudomyxoma developing. And if there's weakness in the muscle wall from vessels or just previous inflammation or damage, Next, you'll get this Hello. 
Yeah, John, you're back again. Yeah. Yeah, I got dismissed somehow. And uh, there's diverticulum like growth and keep clicking next. And you can see that this event, go back one, sorry. This will eventually rupture and you'll get cells and mucin going out into the peritoneal cavity. Next. You can also get areas of weakness in the epithelium and acellular mucin will dissect out through the muscularis propria and then go out onto the peritoneal surface and into the peritoneal cavity. Next. So uh, on the left, you can see then there's an appendix with a rupture and there's cells and mucin heading into the peritoneal cavity. And it's important to note whether there's acellular mucin or cellular mucin going into the peritoneal cavity. And that's because the cellular mucin is much more likely to cause pseudomyxoma. So when it goes into the peritoneal cavity, it will survive and it'll grow and it'll continue to produce mucin and you'll get the development of pseudomyxoma peritoneal. Whereas acellular mucin uh, most likely won't, um, although there are rare cases where that can happen. Next. So that's the potential to spread and cause pseudomyxoma. And then lastly, developing a mucinous adenocarcinoma component. So what do I mean by that? Next. So again, going back, if we have mucin on top and then we have our neoplastic epithelium uh, sitting on top uh, of the muscularis propria, next. Much like in an adenocarcinoma, you can get areas where you get high-grade dysplasia, um, similar to what you might get in the colon, and then next. And eventually those high-grade areas may infiltrate down into where the vessels are, and you'll get single cell or angulated glands invading into the tissue. So this is invasive adenocarcinoma at this point. So you'll notice here that a lot of the background is still that lamin, but at the same time, you have focal areas where there's invasive adenocarcinoma. Those areas could get into the cell or into the vessels or into the nerves and go to distant sites. So the management of this has to be different. You now need to think about lymph node involvement, uh, spread to either liver or lungs and all the things that you'd normally think about in an adenocarcinoma. Next. It also creates a problem in terms of uh, how we look at the appendix and the peritoneum. So on the left, it may be that there's a low grade lesion in the appendix and it ruptures. So this is a lamin. There's no high grade areas or no invasive adenocarcinoma in it. And it develops pseudomyxoma in the peritoneum. But as time goes on, you may get accumulation of mutations in the peritoneal component, and that might become an adenocarcinoma. And you now have a situation where you have a lamin or a low grade lesion in the appendix, but you have an adenocarcinoma in the uh, peritoneal cavity. And because of that, we, ha we have different terminology for the peritoneum and for the appendix. Next, I'm just kicking next again. So for low grade lesions in the appendix, we call them lamin, but in the peritoneum, if you've got that same low grade mucin and cells in the peritoneum, we call it low grade mucinous carcinoma peritonei. Next. If it's a high-grade invasive adenocarcinoma in the appendix, we call it mucinous adenocarcinoma. And if the corollary, if there is in the peritoneum, if the cells become invasive and invade into the organs, we call it high-grade mucinous carcinoma peritonei. There's one other entity next, uh, which is a hamon. And it's very rare, but I just thought I'd briefly mention it because it can be a bit confusing as to what that is as well. So a hamon is a high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. Next. And all that is is back to this diagram where you've got the low-grade mucinous epithelium and then if you have an area where there's high-grade epithelium it's the high-grade dysplasia but it hasn't invaded yet that's a hammon. we don't know what to do with these really yet so we treat them uh, as if they are invasive adenocarcinomas next so that's the biology so what do you do if you have a lamin and you didn't expect it it's an appendicectomy and you get a lamin next how to approach the pathology board. First thing to note is, was all of the appendix submitted for microscopic evaluation? This is really important because as I've shown, part of the uh, part of the lamin, there might be a focal area of invasive adenocarcinoma. Next, and that will completely change how you're going to manage the patient. If there is adenocarcinoma within it, there's the potential for lymph node spread. And that means that you need to do a right hemicolectomy to take out the lymph nodes and the drainage. Whereas if it's all lamin, there's no risk of lymph node mets, and therefore you don't need to do a right hemicolectomy. Next. And the only way you can exclude this high-grade hamon or invasive adenocarcinoma is to really evaluate all of the appendix. And oftentimes pathologists, they may not submit the entire appendix. Next. And sometimes when we see these patients that are MDM, by the time we realize that they haven't submitted all of the appendix, it's too late. The appendix has been thrown out, and we don't know then what the rest of the appendix shows. Next.
next again, the next thing to look for is if there's any component of high grade disease or invasive adenocarcinoma or if there's signal ring cells. Next. And again, just following on from what I just said, if this is present, this means that it's not a lamin and the patient needs a right hand colectomy. Next. It's difficult sometimes to, to be sure that there's not invasive adenocarcinoma. So if there's uncertainty with your pathologist, there should be a low threshold to send for the send the slides for a second opinion. Next. You also need to be very uh, wary of whether there's mucin breaching the peritoneal surface or not, because this determines the risk of pseudomyxoma peritonei. If there's no mucin breaching the peritoneal surface or no cells, the risk is extremely low that this patient is going to recur or develop pseudomyxoma. Next. Uh, some things that are important to, to tell the pathologist. Uh, if you took the appendix out and you accidentally or there, for some reason mucin extruded from the appendix after you removed it, that's important for the pathologist to know so they don't erroneously attribute T4A when it's not really T4A. Next. And it's also important to tell the pathologist if you see mucin intraoperatively, don't wipe it off the appendix and let the pathologist know because then uh, by the time they examine it, sometimes the mucin can either dissolve or get wiped away where, during processing, so we won't see it microscopically. Next. And, and then the other thing to note is whether or not the mucin in, on the surface, if it contains neoplastic cells, and as I've already mentioned, next, this is important because there's a much bigger, there's a significant increased risk for either recurrent disease or pseudomyxoma if there's cellular mucin on the surface of the appendix. Next. Some things that aren't as important, which you might consider important in other reports. Next. Uh, there shouldn't be lymph node involvement, lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion in a lamin. So if it's present, reconsider the diagnosis. There may be an invasive adenocarcinoma component in the appendix. Next. And uh, in you know, sort of counterintuitively, the margin status isn't uh, as critical in a lamin. Uh, so if if you're sure that it's all low grade disease, the margin status, even if it's positive, we wouldn't use that as a criteria to go back and do a hemicolectomy. Um, next. So what next? You've got your report. It's a lamin. And you're happy that it's a lamin. What should you do next? Next again. So the treatment and surveillance, all lamins, the patients with lamins should have a CT abdo pelvis to outrule peritoneal disease, and they should also have a colonoscopy to outrule a synchronous colorectal carcinoma. Next. The recommendations are that the pathology slide should be reviewed by a pathologist who is experienced in appendiceal pathology, and this is to make sure we don't miss a high-grade lesion. Next. If there is no peritoneal disease and it's all lamin, the patient should go into a surveillance program. We do not do a right hemicolectomy or an iliocolonic resection. Uh, because it's not indicated, there's no need to drain the, to, to get the lymph nodes because they're not going to be involved. Um, and there's some uh, evidence to suggest that we should do reduced surveillance in lamas that are confined to the appendiceal walls. So those are the in situ ones. Next. Next. If there is peritoneal involvement, we you would refer the patient for assessment for cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. There isn't any role for chemotherapy because this is all low grade disease. Uh, if you find high grade disease, that might change if you found it in the peritoneum. And as I've mentioned, if there's high grade or invasive areas, you treat it as invasive adenocarcinoma and the patient should have a right hemicolectomy. And then depending on that, they may end up with chemotherapy or cytoreductive surgery, depending on their disease extent. Next. Our surveillance program, we do annual tumor markers uh, and we also do an annual CT scan, usually up to five years. And then we re re reassess the risk and may continue or stop at that point. Uh, it's a central link, but we do get the scans and tumor markers performed locally. Next. So one slide briefly on carcinomas. Next. So carcinomas, again, as we've talked about mucinous adenocarcinomas, so they arise from lamins. Uh, they might be a minor component or they could be a major component uh, of the tumor. Next. There are intestinal type adenocarcinomas. These are just the same as colorectal cancers. They arise from adenomas in the appendix and they're, they're very similar to their colorectal counterparts. Next. And then there's a, a newer entity called goblet cell adenocarcinoma and this used to be called goblet cell carcinoid. Next. We don't use the term goblet cell carcinoid anymore. It's obsolete and that's because carcinoid implied that it was a low grade lesion when it's not, it's an adenocarcinoma. And for all of these, the treatment is a right hemicolectomy. Next. There are some benign entities just to very briefly mention. Next. So adenoma of the appendix, 
uh, next as appendiceal serrated polyps. So these are precursor lesions. The adenoma is the same as a tuber or tubular villus adenoma in the colorectum, and serrated polyps are similar to sessile serrated lesions. It possibly is a precursor to lamin. Next. Uh, colonoscopy is recommended for, for these patients, but other than that, there's no follow up needed. Next. One thing to briefly mention is ruptured serrated polyps, very rare, but uh, we don't know if the patient is at risk of pseudomyxoma because of this, uh, because serrated lesions might be precursors to lamin. So some surveillance is probably worthwhile. Next. And then briefly, some mimics of appendiceal tumors. So patients who have had interval appendicectomy or chronic appendicitis, they can get a sort of mucinous reaction after as part of the healing process and there's mucin within the um, mucin within the appendix. Next. Diverticulosis can very much mimic a, an appendiceal tumor. Next. And retention cysts, which is when you have a fecalith and the appendix fills up with mucin. So all of these can be confused with lamins and it's very important that you get the right diagnosis in these situations. So we usually advise to refer to a specialist center. Next. Uh, we, we can skip this. I, I had I hadn't really intended for this to be part of the uh, talk, so we can just skip through this. I think in the interest of time, uh, we got we neuroendocrine neoplasms are very separate, and I think it's the the size criteria. And as Des mentioned before, uh, the mesopendiceal invasion, uh, lymphovascular invasion, and the grade are the important points for neuroendocrine tumors. Next again, keep going through. And intraoperative management. So this this is up to now has been post appendectomy. Next, and just click next through for the next couple. So should you perform the appendectomy or defer? Um, so you should perform the appendectomy if you can, if there is a suspected neoplasm. Right hemicolectomies or early colonic resections are not appropriate though if you want to try and get lymph nodes because it could be a lamin and you don't need to do it then. Uh, obviously, there's situations for in terms of ischemia or for some other reason that you might need to do a hemicolectomy, but that's a separate issue. And it's always worthwhile assessing for the presence of mucin uh, in the peritoneum. So these are below are the most common sites that you would find mucin. Next. So summary, next, and just click through. So a lamin, as I said, it's a special type of tumor. Just make sure the appendix is entirely examined. Usually they're surveyed and we don't do a hemicolectomy. Carcinomas, we do hemicolectomy if possible, just to know goblet cell adenocarcinomas are not, uh, goblet, not goblet cell carcinoids anymore. Be wary of chronic appendicitis, diverticulosis and retention cysts, and neuroendocrine tumors, not gonna discuss them today, but just that there are certain markers that you need to know in the pathology report in terms of making a decision about hemicolectomy. Next. Let's just click through the end. This is the last slide, so we have a, uh, an MDM every fortnight where we discuss these tumor and we enroll patients in their surveillance program. I'm happy to see any case, public or private, for free. Uh, you can email me if you have a case and MDM referrals to Una, our nurse, or to Jurgen himself. And that's the end. I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you, John. Uh, it's always very interesting. The technology lets us down, and I thought you handled that perfectly. And you provided great clarity on what is a, a complex subject. So I think Des can come back in at this stage. And uh, I think the traditional fallout is that we open this out to the, the wider audience, which is a big audience for uh, questions. Uh, Ronan, I think there have been questions coming through to you. Well, thank you. And thank you both. Uh, Des, uh, a very practical talk. Uh, one of the issues um, is, uh, whether or not you should be doing ultrasound and you kind of said that it wasn't great in in certainly in adults it, it may not be great it may have a better role in in children uh tom walsh asks what about the point of care ultrasound performed by surgeons or ed staff yeah so um my own practice i tend to do an ultrasound when i think it's not appendicitis and um, if i'm clinically fairly convinced i would just go ahead and do a laparoscopy um we we audited our appendicectomies recently and looked at our ultrasound. We found a very high false negative rate for ultrasounds, um, and, uh, kind of falsely reassuring in some cases. So I don't tend to use them unless I think it's not appendicitis. We have uh, fairly quick access to beds and to, we have a 24 hour emergency theater. So we tend to get our patients in for laparoscopy very early on during daytime working hours. And often an, an ultrasound doesn't change the outcome. 
and delays us getting them to theatre and pushes it into after hours. And so, certainly in my opinion, a, a laparoscopy is a better test than an ultrasound. And what uh, about CT scan? Yeah, so CT has a high a high spec- uh, sensitivity and is, is very accurate, um, and it was something you use. One of the things I did try to find an answer for I didn't put in the presentation was, if you're convinced it's appendicitis, do you still need to do a CT? And I couldn't really find any good papers that looked at that. They all looked at the kind of the, the grey case trying to decide was it appendicitis or not. Uh, but how often, if you felt it was appendicitis, would CT change your management? I couldn't find an answer to that. Although we all have cases where the diverticulitis is a bit more on the right side than the left. Um, and so in adults, particularly over the age of about 25 or 30, I would be much more liberal in my use of CT. But obviously, we don't tend to use it in children. And in terms of um, sort of late teens, early 20s, male and female, do you have a different approach? Um, so, yeah, males, I would tend to, to have a lower threshold for laparoscopy. Um, I would certainly allow the bloods to guide us. If both inflammatory markers are raised, it would certainly in, uh, increase my suspicions. Um, in females, um, a lot, I think, goes, comes down to the clinical exam and to the history, whether it was a sudden onset of pain or something that snuck up on them over 24, 36 hours. Uh, I think the clinical exam is very important and I certainly, if I have a low suspicion for appendicitis, I, I'm quite happy to sit in them for another six or eight hours. I think doing an ultrasound at that time is a useful use of that time then coming back and examining them later that day. Um, but I, I'm very much biased towards clinical exam uh, rather than imaging in the younger teenage population. Well, I'm delighted to hear the art of surgery is alive and well and being practiced uh, in Mullingar and the Mater. Um, John, uh, you, you've, you've uh, showed us in, in wonderful uh, detail the, the complexities of lamin and, and, and all of, of these things. I mean, what percentage of, of the appendixes that come through your day to day uh laboratory are of any concern um i kind of saw four percent there uh come through is that b- about what it is yeah i mean i guess here we're a bit skewed i think in a general uh a general population four percent yeah that's probably even a bit high it's it's probably one to two percent in a general sort of uh, population i think four percent if it's an interval appendectomy perhaps um um, so it, it is a rare thing. You probably won't see them that often, but um, I think on top of on top of that percentage, there are the cases of chronic appendicitis, diverticulosis, things where we're, you know you query that it might be it, and it's really important to get those right because the surveillance program, you know, it's yearly annual CT scans for for many years. So making sure you get the diagnosis correct at the beginning is is very very important. And Jurgen, have you seen an increased incidence of stump appendicitis with with laparoscopy? It's my my sense that it's uh, when you're not inverting uh, the stump that as we used to do in the open appendicectomy, and you're leaving maybe a two centimeter base of the appendix, which you probably shouldn't do, but people do do. Uh, is this something you're seeing? Uh, I think I've only seen it once or twice, so it's certainly not something that's coming along on a uh, on a regular basis. Um, we do have an older catchment in the in the matter, and we probably do a disproportionately low number of appendicectomies for appendicitis here compared to maybe other hospitals. So it's not coming through in our practice, perhaps perhaps elsewhere, but I'm not hearing about it. Um, and and Des, you're you're not seeing it. Uh, I've seen one case in the last five or six years. She had her initial surgery in Dublin and then uh, came back with an abscess, uh, which was reported on the CT as an intramural abscess, but was obviously a stump appendicitis. And when we went back in and did the interval, I'd say there was four, four and a half centimetres of appendix left. Um, so I'm very keen to with the trainees to make sure that they make their window right at the base of the appendix. And they look for the point where the three tinea coli uh, converge at the base of the appendix and get their two endo loops on there. And if the base is, is a bit sloughy or dodgy, what's your recommendation? Then mobilize the cecal pole and come across it with an endo GIA. Uh, very wise, very wise.
And and the last uh, tricky one for you is, what if you think there's Crohn's disease there? Should you take the appendix out or leave it? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think if you think they have acute appendicitis as part of their Crohn's, you probably need to take the appendix out. If it's perforated, it's an easy, an easy one. If I, if I was faced with that, I again would tend to mobilize and come across it with a stapler rather than just tr trusting the end loops. But if you get in there and, and there's widespread Crohn's and the appendix you think is a bit reactive to it, then I'd be inclined to leave it. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. But the uh, and one of the messages for the, for the, all the trainees, if there's an appendicolith, you must actually make sure you retrieve it because uh, uh, years hence it will cause trouble as you as you showed in your case Des, and I, that was my experience too uh i don't see any other questions have come through on the chat so uh, i i think we've maybe had I, maybe i might ask Des, a quick question Des, on the on the concept of uh, non-operative management do you discuss this as an option with patients who have uncomplicated appendicitis do you even bring it up as something that should be considered uh, no, is the honest answer. Um, occasionally patients will ask and uh, we discuss it and certainly I know during COVID, in the very early days of COVID when we weren't entirely sure about gases spreading COVID around theatre and we treated, uh, there's one particular girl uh, I remember treating her with antibiotics and she's still on my waiting list to come back in and have her interval because she still has ongoing symptoms. Um, I, I would tend to um, I wouldn't tend to offer it if parents bring it up. I would discuss it, but I would be very much trying to influence them towards having the surgery. That's an interesting question because, of course, um, you know, it's a it doctor knows best, and and that's that's uh, that's that's a tricky one, particularly if you're dealing with parents, uh, and and they. Um, they go and find out that it perhaps was an option, and particularly if somebody gets a, a wound infection afterwards. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's defendable, but it's uh, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I agree. I, I certainly think it was one of my girls, they'd be having their appendix out, and that's kind of the way I tend to think about it. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't recall ever having a difficulty with a parent. Um, most of them were, are quite happy to accept your opinion on it. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it's going to arise at some stage. And and just my last uh, thing was something that I would tell the residents every time. Uh, the patient needs to know that there's a one in eight chance that they'll get a wound infection or that they'll come back in with the fever uh, because it's about, uh, it's about a 12% incidence of some kind of infectious complication after acute appendicitis. And if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. You didn't tell them. Um, I, can yeah. see, I can see Jürgen smiling because I'm sure I told him too. <laughs> it's still in my head, it's imprinted forever. Good, well can I thank you all for a really interesting uh, webinar, uh, very practical, very helpful and thank you all for joining us. We had uh, upwards of 100 people listening in this evening and we look forward to um, our next webinar which will be uh, from Northern Ireland, uh, looking at the situation uh, as pertains to surgery del delivery in Northern Ireland, the difficulties that they're having there at the minute. So good evening to everybody and thank you again to our presenters. Thank you.